If today we think we need more female leaders, imagine what it felt like to be a woman over a hundred years ago. You had to be exceptional or exceptionally lucky to make your mark. Cue a British princess who became a Romanian queen and made her name during World War I. Welcome to Who is Romania and Queen Marie, an outstanding monarch who adored her adopted country. It's no coincidence that I'm sitting in the Kentish countryside, very near the childhood home of Queen Victoria's most ambitious, most beautiful granddaughter. Born in 1875, she had extraordinary lineage on both sides. Marie could boast, among her first cousins, the future King of Britain, George V, and also Tsar Nicholas of Russia. As for our precocious peaches and cream little princess, well aged 17 in 1893, she was married off to the plainest prince in Christendom. Heir to the Romanian throne, please meet German Ferdinand. As for Marie, she later admitted that she had no real idea where Romania was on the map. But to be fair, few did in the West. It was a relatively new country and one that Queen Victoria dismissively referred to as part of the barbarian East. There was a perfect storm of events which saw Marie ascend to the Romanian throne just after the outbreak of World War I. A passionate Anglophile, she pushed hard to get Romania to commit to the side of the war with the Entente, that was Britain, France and Russia. And finally, in August 1916, Romania enters that war initially with disastrous results. The Germans are in Bucharest by Christmas. But it's Marie that makes sure Romania and its cause are kept alive in the international press. This was the first real era of mass media photographic journals, newspapers, moving footage and film. And what's fascinating is how well Marie was able to use that for the advantage of her country. She was well known throughout the world as a frivolous princess with handsome lovers and fairy palaces, one who loved to dress up in Romanian peasant costume and all sorts of outlandish fancy dress. But when war broke out, she subjugated that skittish image in favour of the idea of Marie as a sacrificial queen. Overnight, she became the iconic pin-up nurse who was saving her poor, brave peasant soldiers who were fighting for their queen and country. And it's really important at this time to recognise just how big a deal the cult of the nurse was. It was established early on in Britain by this woman, Florence Nightingale, during the Crimean War and had reached epic proportions by World War I, especially when that other famous British nurse, Edith Cavell, was executed by the Germans in 1915. Marie took this idea of nursing and injected it with as much theatre as she could. In Britain, it was the modest little cap and apron. Not so Marie, she went full Eastern Orthodox, head to toe whites, a standout, powerful image. It became her sort of hallmark. She was obsessed with making sure this Madonna-style nursing queen was then captured by all the visiting press. Foreign journalists, foreign cinematographers, they were taken to see Marie as she tended to her soldiers. Now bear in mind that at the time, typhus was ripping through the Eastern Front. So many of these soldiers were highly infectious and she was actually advised, look, wear gloves. And she was like, what? no, good heavens, and expect them to kiss Indian rubber. No, no, she understood that the imaging was all the more potent because of the danger that was involved. Here was a saintly queen putting herself on the line to save her Latin-blooded soldiers. Marie really knew what she was doing. The idea of the peasant as the sort of purest distillation of the nation was incredibly popular at the time. People actually believed that peasants made better soldiers. And Marie takes the idea of Romania as the ultimate peasant land and really pushes it when the country finally commits to war in 1916. And in fact publishes a book called My Country and it's full of mesmerising rustic photographs, lots taken by her own fair royal hand. And it gets a lot of press in Britain, it's even serialised in the Times. And in it she writes of Romania's soul, its atmosphere, of its peasants and soldiers of things that made me love this country, that made my heart beat with its heart. And alongside these poetic words, you have extraordinary images of Romanians 
head to toe in sheepskins. Of course, this was happening during the Great War and it was a war that was all about propaganda. People needed to believe they'd back the right and just cause and Marie knew how to convince them. She was the master of propaganda. On the one hand, she convinced people she was the queen of a small country. And on the other hand, she was quite quick to remind the British king, have I not English blood in my veins? The press simply couldn't get enough of her. And in fact, by the middle of 1918, the New York Times had decided that she was one of the conflict's vivid and unforgettable personalities. A year later, and there she is again, Queen Marie, one of the very few high profile women at the Paris Peace Conference. And she's installed in true regal style at the Ritz and claims she's arrived to give Romania a face. And to be fair, the press do swarm over her and she joshes with everyone, all sorts of politicians. What should I wear to meet the American president? A pink chemise? As I said, she's not a shrinking violet and really clearly loves it, which does help. I mean, if you're there to do a job, it really is a benefit if you're seen to be enjoying it. And she works both sides of Romania's image very cleverly. On the one hand, she reminds everyone of the sacrificial cost of this war. I think something like one eighth of Romania's population had died. And on the other, of course, she can dazzle as a royal and remind everyone of that splendidness of little Romania, no matter that in fact, it was about to double in size and become the fifth biggest country in Europe. Nothing lasts forever, and to be fair, Marie did have a hell of a time in the 1930s when her eldest son, Carol II, becomes king of Romania. And then, of course, the communists tried to bury and belittle her legacy, but it's very hard to hide star quality like that forever. And a very recent reminder of just how important she remains as a Romanian figurehead is this extraordinary bronze statue of Marie really at her zenith when she was coronated finally as Queen of Greater Romania in Alba Iulia in 1922. And what I love most is that amazing medieval crown. Just look at it. At the time, it was specially designed and forged from Transylvanian gold. What's particularly significant though about this statue, which is commemorating the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I and the inception of Greater Romania, is that in fact it's not installed in Romania, but it's right here in the county of Marie's birth, Kent, in the town of Ashford. Here standeth Marie, reigning supreme over a part of England. And what it does is it reminds us of just how important Marie was to the imaging of her country overseas. And I can assure you that given Marie's sizable ego, she would have absolutely loved this.